Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your panel on Investing in Space, moderated by CNBC anchor Hadley Gamble. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Hadley Gamble. I'm the anchor for the Middle East for CNBC News, and I'd like to welcome you all once again to the Milken Institute MENA Summit. We are going to be talking about investing in space, the final frontier. And to do that, we've got a couple of amazing gentlemen joining us. Naveen Jain, the founder and CEO of Viom, as well as Moon Express. We also have Francois Chopard. He is the founder and CEO of Starburst Aerospace Accelerator. We also have George Whitesides, the CEO of Virgin Galactic. And I'm also joined by Admiral Bob Harwood, the CEO of Middle East Lockheed Martin, and the former Deputy Commander, U.S. Central Command. Gentlemen, welcome. One day I'm going to get more women on these stages. Yeah. So I want to kick off by talking a little bit about a scene setter when it comes to investing in space. Can I get a show of hands of who in the audience would actually want to invest in space? <laughs> wow, not bad. Not bad, not bad. I'm going to kick off with Naveen here because when you give me the sell of what could potentially come of investing in space, I got to tell you, it, it gets very interesting. So I think to me, going to the space is really not about just going to space. It is symbolic of what individuals and entrepreneurs are capable of doing. So when you land on the moon, it's not about that we landed on the moon. It's simply about what you and I can do that only, the, these are the things that only the superpowers did before. And now a small group of people are capable of doing that. And if we can land on the moon, is there any problem that we can't solve on planet Earth? Whether it is solving the problem of healthcare, whether it is fixing the education system, creating the abundance of food, creating the abundance of water, creating the abundance of land, there's nothing that is impossible. And to me, this simply shows that what you and I are capable of doing. So to me, the space is not just about space, it's really about dreaming big looking at the moon shots and really believing what is possible. And this is just a symbolic output. George, when you look at what happens next here in terms of the space, because you have big personalities investing in space today, obviously Richard Branson, Elon Musk, and the price points are kind of concerning for everyday people. A trip to space could cost anywhere from 70 million to 175 million. And that's probably conservative at this point. Walk us through what this actually means for everyday people. Well, I think um, at a headline level, the applications of space can benefit a huge range of people, right? So that there, there are now three to five billion people who don't have access to high bandwidth connectivity, and space could be one way that they connect. Um, millions and billions of people have uh, you know, not regular access to, to weather data and, and other forms of um, space applications. Um, locational data has revolutionized our societies in a whole range of levels. So I think um, space applications can have tremendous benefit from the entire value chain. Now, I personally am involved in launch, um, and, you know, I'm happy to tell you, Hadley, that. Um, we're offering trips to space that are only $250,000, so that's about a factor of 300 less than going with the Russians. So, uh, and I apologize if there are any Russians in the audience, but um, you know, what I think is exciting about this era in space is that you're seeing, um, order, you're seeing transformations on the scale of orders of magnitude, right? So, um, as you said, it costs $70 million to go to space. We're going to be offering a different kind of experience, but some, an experience that is hundreds of times less than that. Uh, Will Marshall, uh, CEO of Planet Labs, um, is essentially creating a global constellation for a cost that is, depending on how you calculate it, 1,000 to 10,000 times cheaper than it may have been in the past. And so those are the kinds of revolutionary dynamics that are driving enormous benefit to people on planet Earth. But it's not just about people, is it? I mean, we're talking about making investments to turn a profit. And of course, one of the elements of this is not just data collection on a massive scale, but it's also about communication, as you said, and satellites. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think um, what's driving a lot of this innovation is that all these new forms of capital are flowing into space. So you have uh, not just visionary, um, ultra high net worth individuals like, like my boss, Richard Branson, but you also have uh, amazing venture capitalists. Um, you have uh, established uh, wealth funds like Fidelity putting money in. You have sovereign wealth funds. Um, and so you see this whole range of uh, entities that are investing in space, and they're not doing it because uh, it's sexy. They're doing it because it's something that can drive real returns, that it's, a, that it's an area where innovation is going to drive fundamentally new business models that will create massive wealth, I think, over the next 10 to 20 years. Francois, I want to bring you in on terms of the size of this market, because you're heavily involved in the startup space. Um, so obviously, it's, it's a big market. Uh, but then when you look at all the, the possibilities that we're going to drive with new type of um, you know, space stations, whether they're going to be public or private, what you're talking about, what we can do to the moon, mining of asteroids, we're going to go from a, a market that is r about five to six hundred billion to, uh, uh, to three or four times more than that. Um, and that's why also we are seeing a, a shift in terms of uh, the people who are investing in, in, that, in that business from passionate billionaires, uh, including Bezos, including Bigelow, and a few others, um, to more traditional investors, uh, whether it's um, private equity guys. Uh, we've seen more investors from the, the Silicon Valley or California type of investors. Now, New York money is coming uh, uh, also on the way. And in a city like LA, where we are based, we have more than the, you know, 50 um, amazing startups that want to disrupt space, uh, whether it's rockets, satellites, new type of sensors, new type of vehicles. Um, and we are very proud today to announce a, a new type of accelerator program in partnership with Techstar, but, but most of it, you know, financed by the US Air Force, NASA GPL, Lockheed Martin, Maxar, and a few other corporate partners where we're going to pick 10 very early stage startups and we're going to fund them and really mentor them and accelerate them um, to, to make the, the, you know, the, the, the successful company of the future. And in terms of um, nation states investing, we have the rise of China in the private sector as well. Maybe you want to lay in. Yeah, what I was thinking was that, you know, in some sense, most of the investment is still going in the low earth space. And I really think that is the mindset of what the world is. Investors are still not thinking about the big possibility to what it can be. So most investments are still in the low Earth orbit, you know, people launching satellites, people doing this, and everything is incremental. And to me, the really the big change is going to be when people start thinking about what the world can be. How are we going to save the humanities from potential extinction when we are living on a single spacecraft and our spacecraft called planet Earth, what if our spacecraft gets damaged? It's not that our planet won't survive. Our planet will do just fine. It's the human species that may not survive. And we start to think about how do we move and distribute our species from the one space, one planet Earth to Moon and Mars and beyond. And we have to start thinking about what would it take to do that? And we can start to think about, you know, how can we not live on the moon? And the radiation, and yes, there is how do we grow the food, but those are the solvable problem. And maybe I'll spend maybe in the next, you know, next time I get a chance to talk about how do we look at these problems and solve them as a small group of entrepreneurs, and that does not require the resources of large corporations or requires the nation states or superpowers to do something about it. Bobby, you want to weigh in here from a security perspective? Well, I think the, the tipping point will come from partnerships. You're seeing that more and more countries are entering the space uh, ecosystem. Saudi and UAE have, have come in big time. So I think these partnerships that are going to add capacity, capability, intellectual rigor is going to be the tipping ones. The, who can put together these partnerships, leverage uh, all that capacity 
will benefit the most. And you're seeing that happening. Now, who's going to partner and how that's, is that going to be, will it be driven politically or will it be driven financially? And I think at the end of the day, it's going to be a political battle that's going to pay the dividend and achieve the objectives you've just talked about. Certainly shuttle diplomacy. But I, we were speaking a little <laughs> bit earlier, aside from the panel, about the rise of China in terms of their private sector, in terms of their development, and the idea that there are facilities in China today that are the envy of scientists and entrepreneurs in the United States. Yeah, but today, uh, this is a long race. Everybody's in it, and I'll go back to these 80 countries who have entered that are bringing capacity to the table. Some maybe not as large, but just as advanced. And this technology that's going to change the game, artificial intelligence and other factors are, are going to determine that again. So again, I take the long-term approach. We've got to be focused, see what each other, and, and be prepared to react, but don't lose sight of where we're going on this race. Walk us through the timelines here, George, because at the end of the day, investors like to know when they're going to see returns. Well, I mean, I think it uh, depends on what you're talking about, but I think, uh, you know, these global constellations are in, or in orbit now. Uh, you know, uh, um, you have a variety of remote sensing constellations that are going up. Uh, these massive uh, global communication constellations, many obviously already exist now, but some more are going up uh, even bigger. In terms of space transportation, I think you'll be seeing a variety of orbital launch vehicles uh, starting. Um, one of them is Virgin Orbit, which is uh, going to be starting this year. And then in terms of human space flight in the United States, you'll see uh, as many as uh, uh, three or four uh, companies beginning commercial operations, we think will be probably the, the first of them. Um, but uh, you, know, you could literally see uh, three or four human spaceflight operations begin in the United States this year, which is very exciting. And in terms of what's going to happen next, manufacturing, Francoise, you were saying that that's something you can foresee in the very near future. Yes, um, exactly. So we talk about the, the future of space being, you know, um, uh, communications, um, but but also I, I truly believe that um, in the near future, instead of having only one space station, we're going to have you know thousands of them, uh, and it's it's not impossible that it, in the next ten years we're going to end up with you know ten thousand people um, in low Earth orbit, maybe not on the moon, but at, at least low Earth orbit. Um, it's easy to access. We know how to operate and manufacturing products. There's already a couple of startups that are thinking of uh, you know, fiber optics, new type of uh, medicines, um, new type of uh, uh, agriculture and, and foods, uh, but also semiconductors that could be manufactured in, in, in space, bringing back to Earth with a, a real business model. Um, with a real uh, impact with regards to climate yes, change as we, well. Of, to to have a real business model, you need to produce products that are so much better. Uh, then you, you have an, an economical business case by bringing them back on, on Earth. So, um, yeah, imagine a world of, uh, you know, at some point, uh, no more plants on Earth, but uh, everything is manufacturing in space, uh, and then you bring back all, only what you need on Earth to, uh, you know, preserve the planet. And I, s I still think this is just such a small thinking, and we really <laughs> have not been able to capture the imagination and really capture the imagination of the people on Earth. Because unless we can get seven, eight billion people to connect to space, it's always going to be a rich people's thing. It's always going to be someone else's things, right? It's only for the rich people. How do we connect with the people who are on planet Earth? What can we do for them? And to me, it's about you know, bringing the helium-3 to planet Earth so we can say, can we actually provide the clean energy source for the, all of the planet with a small quantity of helium-3? Can we completely start to get people to thinking about, can the honeymoon really be about taking your honey to the moon rather than taking honey to Paris because there will be honey Paris, not honeymoon, right? Can we start to think about replacing the whole diamond industry with moon rocks? Because at the end of the day, Diamonds are neither rare, nor they used to be symbol of love. The moon has been a symbol of love forever and ever. What if we can bring the moon rocks and convert them into essentially symbol of love as diamonds and make diamonds a commodity? Everyone gives someone a diamond. If you love her enough, you give her the moon. Don't promise her the moon, give her the moon, right? And when, when Hadley, 
is engaged and someone gives us a diamond, Hadley is going to say, are you trying to buy me or something? I thought you loved me because if you loved me, you would have given me the moon, right? So <laughs> I'm going to keep that one. <laughs> you know, I have to weigh in because you've raised some interesting points. I think, you know, when we first started looking at the Mars yeah. program, I was the first to get, I've been married 38 years. Yeah get my wife's name on that list. Yeah. So I dream every day of launching her to Mars for the first opportunity I can. Uh, but, but, uh, but you're dating a scientist. You don't that, love her or something? No, <laughs> but, uh, but the other point on that uh, I wanted to raise, you made me think of, is where we are with technology and how quickly we can have change. Look, I, I ask young kids now, if they, the young engineers, if they, because I was an engineer, and when I, I was first starting, we did everything on a slide rule. And I also had to do a sextant. Damn kids don't know what those are today. <laughs> and that's a good thing. No, that's but good. the pace of change and their ability to leverage technology is what's going to change this. And so that empowers everyone, not just the rich. We have a program here where we have a space fundamental training program. So we take 50 students from the local universities, we link them with our engineers, and we're introducing them to the tools of the trade. We're inculcating it, that into their psyche now. And it's some of those folks who are gonna make these quantum changes that will get us there sooner instead of later. So I, I don't think it's a rich man's program. I think it's every, every person's program and the opportunities are more prevalent now than they've ever been before. It's also, though, about personalities, isn't it? Because obviously, George, your background is NASA. So working within the government constraints, then you get on board with Richard Branson. And you know, if you dream big, then you can make it happen. But there are questions about safety when it comes to space. I mean, Challenger comes to mind. How do you navigate that? Because what you're trying to do there is convince people to go literally to a, a new frontier. But there are concerns. Yeah, I think, um, obviously, I think safety is a huge issue. Um, in our personal case, uh, we're doing a tremendous amount of testing, and our flight to space in December was a great milestone for the company because um, it was uh, an end-to-end -end demonstration of the entire um, space flight mission that we'll be doing. But I think, um, you know, it's like any new product that you want to put people in. There's a tremendous amount of innovation going on in the transportation sector, whether you're talking about cars or trains or flying, uh, you know, electric vehicles or space. And, um, you know, what is important about all of those is that you undergo rigorous testing to make sure that, as an engine, you know, that your engineers are content with um, putting humans on, on board. And that's what certainly what we're, we're doing. In terms of the investments case for the startups that you're working with, Francois. I mean, really, it's anything goes when it comes to dreaming big and finding investors to make that happen. But your investor base is changing as well. And that does have something to do with the security and viability of these investments. Um, yes, I, I agree. Security is important. You, you don't want any disasters. Um, one of the main reasons the Concorde stopped flying is because it was becoming you know, more and more difficult to maintain it. and. Uh, or too, cost, too costly, and so they had to stop. It's probably the same thing with the space shuttle, not some good press on a couple of um, times. So, of course, safety is an issue, and it needs to be taken seriously. But it's an industry that has safety in its DNA. So I'm less concerned about that aspect, and more concerned of you know, making um, some realistic business case. Uh, at the end, you know, uh, as we are more, more investors coming to the game, um, we don't, we don't, it's, it's a question of safety also. We don't want to scare them. And so we want to build strong teams, strong business case. And, and I think we are at the right time now. Um, we are talking about the amount that is invested. Um, usually what we hear is that safe, uh, space is really capital intensive. But I, I, at lunch, I was sitting um, near the close to the, the CEO of Freshly, uh, a food company delivering fresh meals to your door. They just raised 100 million, and he was saying that he needs to at least raise two or 300 more you know, to make his business um, uh, profitable and, and good enough. So, um, and Deliveroo and SoftBank just invested one billion in Deliveroo. Um, I think space is not that much capital intensive than any of this business. Um, it's just a different asset we use. We used to not think of space as something accessible for a, um, a sole in investor. 
um, costs of developing this product are coming way, way down. Uh, building a space station now would be so much cheaper than what NASA did 60 years ago. Um, and it's a really, really a good timing. Uh, but also, I think it's becoming so much cheaper because everything that's making our phones thinner, cheaper, and faster is making those sensors really make the, exactly. you know, like lander, our yeah. lunar lander, when we started 10 years ago, we thought it was going to cost $100 million. Mm -hmm. Our marginal cost, including our launch, is going to be under $10 million. And that, to me, would have never thought possible to have a lunar lander, including the cost of the launcher, the a rocket, is going to be under $10 million. And that, to me, is just the beginning of where things are going to start, that <clears throat> not only the cost of going to the space is getting smaller, the people are starting to dream bigger and bigger. And mm -hmm. you're starting to see the benefit of that coming back on a planet Earth mm -hmm. while looking at the long-term goal of creating a multi-planetary society. So I really believe that we are going to win. And the only reason we're going to win is because we're going to start to capture people's imagination. We're going to take them on this journey that it's not just for select few. It will be for everyone. And everyone is going to benefit from what is being done here. And we cannot have a space that's only done by the you know, nation states. The NASA, I was at NASA JPL, and I was looking at their Mars 2020 lander. That's not even ready to go yet. And they're using Intel 286 chip that has not been produced for 20 years <laughs> because that's what they knew worked. Oh my God, this thing. <laughs> Mosquito is like... <laughs> that's why we need to go to the space. You can't, can't have these mosquitoes there. Uh -huh. uh, but the point is, they were so afraid to try... He likes you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very sweet, but that's not it. Uh, you know, they still are not able to try anything new, they go back to the same thing what they did 20 years ago. And I really believe this is the reason why the entrepreneur is going to fundamentally change the methodologies and the investment in space. The, you know, if you look at the uh, reusable rocket, it wasn't done by NASA, it was done by a private company. A lot more of innovation is coming from private company than it ever came from the uh, you know, states. And the reason for them is, at NASA their goal is, Failure is not an option. And that really means is really doing anything meaningful is not an option, right? Because unless you're willing to fail, how can you move the innovation forward? Innovation means uh, failure. Even today, people believe the flights are really, really safe. We go on a flight, millions of us. What do we say when someone goes on a flight? Have a safe flight. When was the last time you heard of a plane not being safe? The fact is ingrained into us that any time you leave Earth, it is unsafe. And we say people will have a safe flight. Should, why should we say that? It, we never see somebody go in an elevator, have a safe elevator, right? Why is that? But what are we missing here from a national security perspective? Because undoubtedly, whether they come and knock on your door or not, whether they're the US government, the Chinese government, when something is developed that becomes interesting to them, they're going to get involved. Hopefully, they're going to invest. But they're going to want that data, and they're going to have access in some way. Well, I, I think the game changer uh, from the old state model where it was uh, government con controlled, government influence and government funding is the entrepreneurs now. They've made the wild card here. They're making advances to more cheaply, smarter and better than government entities could. So that becomes a balancing act between these nation states and their abilities to touch that. And I think that the Western uh, nations right now have a much better model for innovation that they've been able to, to leverage and they'll call on that in the future and, and rely on that. I think these are perfect examples as you've talked about, ability to produce a, a, a rocket for $10 million. Now they're, of course, they're watching closely, want to leverage that, steal that, leverage that. But I think we're staying ahead of that curve, but they can't recreate that process, that, that system of innovation that Western democracies have inculcated into their economic model. And that, so that's the real challenge for them. How did they keep up with that? It, well, in terms of democratizing those investments, Francois, where would you put your money today? Tell the investors in this room. Yeah, it's, a, it's a good point. Um, and another area that's, um, sp that space industry is going to transform is the, the transportation. 
Um, and as Virgin Galactic is working on it, SpaceX with the, the big rocket is working on it, is the, the point to point. Um, right now, transportation is, is facing a, a massive disruption, um, not through car or autonomous car, but everything that flies. And, and I truly believe that the, the future of Earth um, will be people on the ground, but every, most, every transportation will be in the air, whether it's uh, you know, flying taxi, delivery drones, or cargo drones. Um, different type of airplane, whether they're going to be electric or supersonic, and, and using these new type of cheap rockets um, that cost you know a couple of hundred thousand to ref dollars to refuel um, to go from New York to Tokyo, um, and that's an area. So uh, a new type of uh, you know cheap rocket engines, new type of, of you know spacecraft, and all the technology that are related to that, whether it's you know new type of sensors, communication, materials that's going to allow us to move um, from one point on, on Earth to another point much, much smoothly, definitely. And George, in terms of the timeline, I mentioned this before, but how close are we to that, whether it be space taxis or to making all new industries as a result of our mobility? Um, well, as I say, I think we'll be flying people to space this year. And uh, at least for our own company, our aspiration is to build vehicles of increasingly longer uh, range. Um, our initial vehicles are just going up to space and coming back down. Um, but I think um, that uh, you know, within five years, we could have um, vehicles that could start doing uh, longer duration point-to-point -point vehicles. Now, those might be sort of early stage things. Um, but I think, you know, we've been stuck at Mach 0.8 for a really long time, essentially since the dawn of the jet age, you know. And I think that we really, as you say, Naveen, we need to open our minds, right? And it's so exciting to be in a place like this, to be at a conference like this, where you have a confluence of ideas and capital that can actually change the world. And that's why I find it so exciting to come to UAE, come to Abu Dhabi, come to Dubai, because it's a place where the future is being built before your eyes, you know, and it's a place that has fundamentally changed the course of transportation in our, on a planetary level, and that's really interesting, right? And if this could be sort of the center of a new, tr a new uh, revolution, both in terms of electric, but also, I think, in terms of intercontinental, I mean, what a tremendous change that would bring to the planet. And so, I think it's a very exciting time. So, George, you come here also to thank your investors. Yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, we're very grateful for that. Yeah, and, you of know, course, I mean, of course. people who have the vision to, you know, invest in these futuristic um, businesses, I think it's what we need for the planet, Absolutely. right? You I'm know? Not, I'm, that was just my. Uh, the yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, what I was thinking was, I mean, if you start to think about. You keep asking about timing and nobody wants to give you a timing, so I'm going to give you the timing. I believe in the next 10 years, we're going to be people going to the moon for under $10,000. How about that? 10 years, $10,000 going to the moon and there's going to be a baby born on the moon in the next 15 years. When the baby is going to be born, the parents are going to be looking at the baby and saying, you know we come from that planet, looking up to the planet Earth. And that is the scenario I'm telling you is going to happen in our lifetime. So movement is aside, what about the other industries? Mining on the moon. Mining the moon is going to happen in the next, two, the next three to five years. You're going to start seeing, not only we're going to be la la launching our mission to the moon next year, we're going to start seeing many, many missions to the moon and bringing the material back from the moon. And also really using the resources on the moon to live on the moon. So it's going to be in situ mining to be able to use the resource. Why do I want to live on the moon? I tell you why. Yeah. It's a, first of all, it's a beautiful view. I like the UAE. <laughs> and here's the thing. The, you know, living on the moon, you have this idea of somehow we're going to be living on these tents and we have to wear these weird space suits. And the thing is, because our mind has been conditioned that we can only somehow live on this planet Earth. You know, people talk about radiation. 
And we all know that we have the bacterial organism that grow in the radioactive nuclear waste. That means nature has figured out how to protect its DNA from extremely high radiation. What if we can take a genetic material from these bacteria, use CRISPR to modify our own human body, and suddenly we can be walking on the moon just like we walk on planet Earth. We don't have to create another Earth to live on that place. People say, but how are you going to grow the food on the moon? And that is the dumbest question to ask. Because the question you should be asking is, why do we need to eat the food? And because that problem can be solved, because you can get the energy and you can get the nutrition that you need, whether it's hydrogen or oxygen or nitrogen, those are the solvable problems. And if you can start to think about it, what is the difference? There's going to be amazingly beautiful view with less number of people, <laughs> and they, we can create another Dubai and Abu Dhabi right on the moon. George, walk me through the challenges. I'm sorry? Walk me through the challenges here. <clears throat> um, well, I think all of space technology requires, um, you know, really good people to do it properly. And um, uh, so I think there's a set of technological challenges. Um, there's a set of regulatory challenges. Uh, one of the things that I'm sure you're aware of is that the UAE just passed a new space law, uh, essentially codifying how commercial space activities and other activities can be implemented within the kingdom, which I think is a really exciting development. Sometimes getting through the regulations is as big a challenge as getting through some of the technological challenges. And then I think with certain projects, there are capital challenges. You know, I mean, um, the, what, the things that we are envisioning as a community uh, sometimes take a fair amount of capital. What I think is exciting is that, in, in fact, the, the required capital is in many cases coming down significantly and so that's why you see this much greater range of investors becoming involved in, in the space community. But, um, but I think, yeah, I think you see challenges across all of those. But, I, but the reality of all these projects that are now happening is a sign that these uh, challenges can be overcome and in fact will be overcome to benefit you know, investors and also uh, people, on, people on Earth. Francois, in terms of that investment capacity for startups specifically, what would you like to see in that space, coming be it governments or corporates as well, um, that would really help to galvanize um, investment so far? So when you look at numbers, the numbers have already grown uh, a lot in terms of space in investments. Um, right now, most of the investment is coming from U.S. capital, I would say. Uh, out of the two or three billion that are investing in space startups, which is 70 percent is U.S., um, what I like right now is it's really opening to the world and we see more and more countries who, who want to be part of that uh, adventure and that venture. Um, and I think uh, Abu Dhabi and the UAE um, is, is one of them, very excited about what they can achieve a, as a country. And there's a good alignment of um, you know, their, their um, aspirations, the availability of capital, the availability of uh, you know, of, um, of, of ground and, and space around the year where you can really tr transform that country in a much more manufacturing one. Uh, and at the same time, you have all these startups that are emerging that can get these uh, early s stage seed financing, but at some point, they will need to grow, they will need to have strong support from, from government and uh, strong access to, to capital. Um, and, and countries like the UAE or others are a great place for, for these entrepreneurs to come um, see that way, what, what they can get and set up their, their, you know, their, their company, their manufacturing plants in, in the region like this. Yeah. And Bob, you've said that this really will lead to a whole new economy for the Middle East. Without a doubt. Uh, we're seeing that now, in fact, in some of the programs we've just launched in partnership with uh, Saudi, one of the largest commercial satellites that's covering the area. You're seeing the uh, desire of uh, UAE to be a player going to Mars. Uh, you're seeing, in fact, I remember Dr. al Hababi of the Space Agency when he spoke about four years ago. Uh, he was talking about the commercial aspects, and we said, well, do you see Emiratis going to space? They said, well, that's not our goal. Well, now four year later, years later, they've got guys going. So I think all these are dimensions, the people aspects of it, the side businesses, the industry, are all potentials that UAE and others in the region are, are going to realize very quickly and are moving in that direction aggressively in partnership with the other players in the industry. Well, we just have a few minutes, but before we wrap, I want to get um, just a few thoughts from all of the panelists. We talked about hope. We talked about the sky's the limit in terms of innovation and the 
better access to capital, making this a real opportunity uh, for a different kind of economy, certainly in the region and really globally. But I want to get your outlook for just a few minutes, each of you. I'll start with Francoise in terms of what's next. So my vision again is um, I, I don't want to live on any other planet. I think Earth is still the, the best one that, that we know. And, uh, but I, I want to live on a, a healthy planet. So. Um, I, I, I see space as the, the, the place where we're going to put um, manufacturing, we're, we're going to put mining, we're going to put a lot of things that we don't need to make on, on Earth. Um, and, and, and for me, that, that's the future where um, uh, most of the manufacturing will be done elsewhere. Um, and, and when you look at you know, what we need to develop for, for space, it's a little bit... Um, out of reach, but uh, I truly believe that in, um, in our lifetime, e energy on Earth will be free. Uh, and, and if you think of uh, a free energy accessible to everyone, it basically means that transportation will be free. And so I, I truly see the future where we're going to be able to move from one place to another completely for free and, and we, with no pollution associated. So that's my take that's what i you know i want to achieve as a, an entrepreneur and an, an investor and and what we are developing with, with, with space is a great enabler Bob. the moon look we we were on the moon what was it 50 60 years ago i think we're going to be there in a few more years we've got to get back into recurrency and, and getting back up into the race and where we were before and, and not falling back like we did. So I think that's the next step. And as you know, we're partnering and looking at that. We're going to start moving people into orbit here in the next few years. George. Um, you know, this is about investing in space, right? So I'll take it uh, in that direction. I, I think it's um, safe to say that we've moved from a time in which space investments were sort of the exception to a time in which if you're an investor that's broad-based and you don't have space investments, then you're doing something wrong. And that's because of the technological innovation that's happening that will fundamentally impact major portions of the global economy, whether that's communication, transportation, uh, data, or, or otherwise. And so I think that's a great theme to bring into this Milken conference because it's both exciting and it's an opportunity for the folks who are here. So, Hadley, from my perspective, first of all, I'm going to challenge you when you say the sky is the limit. <clears throat> the reason is, the sky is not the limit. Our imagination is really the limit because there is no such thing as sky. There is no sky does not exist. The sky is simply a figment of our imagination. When you go from here to the moon, you don't say, hey, mom, I just passed the sky. It doesn't exist. Right? So to me, the only thing that limits us to what we can achieve is what we can imagine. In terms of where our future is, we are going to absolutely create so much abundance of the things that we use that they're going to be democratized and they're going to be demonetized. So our you know, healthcare system is going to be completely democratized where people are going to be able to prevent the diseases and people will be able to reverse the diseases. I can absolutely guarantee you in the next 10 years, we're going to be living in a world where being sick is going to be a choice. That means you don't have, just like being healthy is a choice, being sick is going to be a choice. We're going to be living in a world where the education is going to be free to everyone. The energy is going to be democratized and de demonetized. The food is going to be democratized and de demonetized. You're going to have abundance of food, the abundance of agri agriculture, abundance of fresh water. All those things which you think today people are nodding their head, this guy is crazy, that's never going to happen. Mark my words, it is going to happen because you no longer will have to do the same way that we have done in the past. You no longer have to grow the cattle to eat beef. You no longer have to grow the way we grow the food today with all the pesticides. We no longer have to eat the a kind of processed food that we eat today. So I really believe we are living in this amazing decade in the human history where in the next 10 years going to fundamentally change the trajectory of how humanity is going to live and we should be proud of the innovation that entrepreneurs are creating. And if this is not the great time to be alive, there's not going to be any better time. Bravo.
Well, you heard it here, investing in space. I'm going to hold all of you gentlemen to your predictions. In 10 years, we'll be right back here to find out. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.